Alrighty, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. Uh, thanks for everybody for coming to my talk. I'm Chris Hodge, and I am uh, the interoperability engineer for the OpenStack Foundation. And I'm here to talk about the work that I do for the foundation um, and what our interoperability efforts at OpenStack are. Um, a little bit about myself. I got my start with OpenStack uh, probably around the same time that Mark did, if you, if you saw his last talk on, on the OpenStack 101. Um, I, was, I, was, I was at the University of Oregon working on a research cloud computing cluster, and we had decided to install OpenStack. And so they, they alphabetized the release name, similar to what Ubuntu does, and I deployed. Uh, we, we did our beta testing with Cactus, we deployed Essex, um, and the university was running OpenStack up through Grizzly. Uh, that was a three-year project, and uh, when that finished up, I had the opportunity to go work for Puppet Labs. And so rather than just be a deployer of OpenStack software, instead I became a developer of OpenStack, and uh, in some ways took over the Puppet OpenStack project that had been started by Dan Bodie um, and some other people at Puppet, um, you know, but has really, you know, it's left Puppet Labs and it's become a full OpenStack community project. Um, and it's kind of neat seeing the, the, you know, the continuation of my work there you know, it, it, you know, ending at this natural spot where um, where it's it, it's it's been completely turned over to the community and it's now an official OpenStack project, and that's pretty exciting to see. Um, about a year ago, I had an opportunity to join the OpenStack Foundation and work on their interoperability efforts. Uh, it, it, you know, and this is uh, uh, Mark mentioned it in his previous talk. Uh, you know, you know, in part working on this on this DevCore committee. So I'm going to start off a little bit just to get you up to speed on what OpenStack is. It's cloud computing software, and it has a number of different components. But you could almost say that there are a set of core components that are part of OpenStack. We have uh, Nova and Glance kind of give you the core compute components so that you can, so that you can launch virtual machine images. Uh, we have Neutron Networking, which ties all of the networking uh, services together. And then we have two different storage services, uh, a block storage service so that you can attach disk drives to your system, but also uh, an object storage system, so you, you know, similar to what you might find in Amazon's S3. And then tying all this together is Keystone, which provides identity, identity and authorization and authentication. And then built on top of this is an entire ecosystem of other OpenStack projects that give you other uh, they give you other services um, built on top of these core services. And so we have an orchestration engine, we have a messaging service, uh, data processing, uh, telemetry, uh, bare metal, um, a dashboard, you know, and many, many more projects. Uh, you know, one of, the, one of the ways that OpenStack changed in the last year is we went from this model of you're either OpenStack or you're not, and you spend this long time in incubation, where instead, if you have a project which meets the goals of the OpenStack uh, you know, OpenStack as a whole, which is to provide ubiquitous cloud computing, then you can be considered for to become what we call a big tent OpenStack project. Uh, you know, it, it means it, it means you um, you gain access to all the resources of the community, such as code review, the mailing lists, um, the bug trackers. Um, you know, by by following kind of the the OpenStack open source development models, and it's been a really great way for us to admit a lot of projects into OpenStack, but also help redefine. You know, you know w what our core services are. So, as I mentioned before, the mission of the OpenStack Foundation is to produce the is to produce a ubiquitous open source cloud computing platform. And one of the ways that we're attempting to accomplish that ubiquity is through interoperability. So, a little bit of a definition of what interoperability is. Um, this is taken from Wikipedia. Um, but an interoperable system is one whose systems interfaces are understood. So you, you, have, you have interfaces that anyone can look at and they can understand them, they can test them, they can do things against them, and they can, they can use them. The interfaces are durable. Uh, this, just, this isn't just at the time you're using it, but also for the future. They're interfaces that you can expect them to be here now and you can expect them to be there in the future so that you can keep using them and you're not going to have accidental breakages across your systems. And they're also unrestricted, that you can, that anybody can come along and if they have access to the system, they can use the system. Um, and, you know, and, and access is easy to obtain. So we live in an interoperable world. 
right? If you think about all of the aspects of your life that you use on a daily basis, everybody here has a laptop. And when you charge that laptop, you can find an outlet on the wall to plug that into. We have an interoperable electrical grid. Everyone has one of these, a cell phone, right? This is, you know, decades and decades and decades of interoperability, right? Starting with, the, starting with rotary dial telephones and moving on to push button phones, all the way to our cell phones, we're still using the basic telephone systems that we were using, that our, that our parents were using, that our grandparents were using. You know, these are incredibly durable, interoperable systems. Our payment systems, our cars, you, you know, just think about all the things you use on a day-to-day -day basis where the interfaces to those are so well understood that we almost take it for granted. It's harder with software, though, right? You know, one of the things that, that separates hardware and software is hardware is durable, right? A, a phone is a durable thing. It's sending currents over electrical wire. Um, you know, over, over a copper wire. This is how it started. Um, where software is something that's one of the amazing things about software is it can be anything we want, but then it can also be anything we want and it makes it very easy to, for interoperability to break. So that's why it's important early on to look at software and try to design software so that it will be durable, so that it will be usable. And one of the, you know, and we're surrounded by this. You know, all of our web standards HTTP, you know, REST interfaces, these are based upon standards that are durable and have lasted for decades. The same with Ethernet, right? IP addresses, even, e even as we move on to IPv6, we still have IPv4 around as a legacy adapter to IPv6 as our growing needs for the network, for, for network space grows. So interoperable is very important. And interoperability has been important to the OpenStack Foundation since the very beginning. So this text is from the bylaws of the foundation, as it was in January 1st of 2012. Um, your product must pass any faithful implementation test suite determined by the technical committee um, to verify that you are implementing a sufficiently current and complete version of the software and to ensure compatibility and interoperability, right? This was a statement that was made nine months before the OpenStack Foundation you know, became a thing. Now, OpenStack it existed long before this, but it's in the founding documents that we want to be interoperable and we want to provide a, we want to provide a number of clouds that could all talk to one another. So fast forward a year to the OpenStack Summit in Hong Kong. Not much headway had been made on the interoperability efforts. Those FITs, the, those FITs tests, never really materialized. Um, and it was that time that the, board, the OpenStack Board of Directors uh, passed a board resolution establishing the DEF Corps Committee. And the DEF Corps Committee's job was to establish an interoperability standard for the application of the trademark to OpenStack powered products. So this committee worked for a solid year and they started with a set of guiding principles. The first was that implementations that are core can use the OpenStack trademark. So we're saying that something is core and it can use the OpenStack trademark. And that core is a subset of the OpenStack project. And so you look at all of the projects that are available to us. And what we're saying is that a small set of those are core and they, and they, are, and they make up what is the trademarkable OpenStack for now. And then this is gonna cover all usage models, public clouds, private clouds, and distributions, right? So that all deployments of OpenStack are equal in the eyes of interoperability because it's absolutely essential. And that OpenStack is code and APIs. So it's not sufficient for you to just put up a service that has the APIs and run the interoperability tests against it and say that, look, I'm running OpenStack, if it's your own special sauce. There's actually this, what, what the interoperability standard doing is saying that you got, if you want to be called OpenStack, you have to be running the code that is developed by the thousands and thousands and thousands of hours that have been put in by the community. Projects also have to have an open reference implementation. Um, I think they're referring to DevStack here, um, which is, uh, you know, if you want to get started with, with OpenStack on your laptop right now, you can download it and run it, and you can install almost any service. Um, but thankfully, vendors may substitute alternative implementations because nobody wants to run a production cloud with DevStack. Tests can be remotely or self-administered. This is another important concept. How can you know if a cloud is interoperable? You shouldn't have to take my word for it. You should be able to prove that for yourself. But that has some consequences associated with it. 
one of that is you can't, you, you can't require any interoperability tests that have administrator access. And so a side product of this is all of the tests that you run to check your interoperability have to be available to end users and they have to be available to guests with non-privileged access. There are must-pass tests. There's not a curve that we grade on here. Um, it's you either pass all of the tests and you comply with the standard and you're interoperable, or you're not, right? You know, there, um, it, you know, and this is something that, you know, again, it helps to guarantee that a standard that all the APIs are available and that if something has the OpenStack powered logo on it, you know for certain that certain, certain APIs and certain capabilities will be there for you to use. Um, this was a change from the original FITS definition. Previously, it said that the technical committee uh, was responsible for defining what the tests were. This actually set the responsibility for defining what core is back to the board. And one part of the rationale behind this was, was that since this is in part trademark protection, that this is what the board is ta was tasked for. And so the board should be responsible for, for defining this. Now, this isn't to say that we don't take input from the community at large, because we rely heavily upon the input. But at the end of the day, determining what the exact standard is is, is by the board. And, and right now, it, happen, it happens every six months. And so what is core? Coming back to the original question. Core is the API and code of OpenStack that passes all of the must-pass tests. So with that, the Dev Core Committee got to work on guidelines. And the guidelines are the official documents that say what the interoperable standards are. So they consist of sections called components. A component is essentially is a, is a product that qualifies for a trademark. And so in this case, right now, the guideline has two components, compute and storage. Um, we can also combine those two components to create a third product, which we call a platform. So we have OpenStack Compute, OpenStack Storage, and OpenStack Platform. And these all fall under the logo of the OpenStack Powered. The definition of those components are done in a couple ways. The first is you have to have common code. These are the designated sections. Now, if you, were, if you recall back to the guidelines, one of them is that vendors don't have to run the reference implementation. They don't have to run the reference code. They do have to run some of the code, but there is an opportunity for them to, to substitute things out, like specific drivers for hypervisors or storage or you know, different methods that add you know, some level of security or some level of, um, you know, of uh, um, durability to their system. But there are certain things that have to exist. And this code is generally defined by the technical leads of the projects. We also have common APIs, uh, which are defined by capabilities. And so the way that works in our guideline is that we have a list of capabilities that might say something like boot and image. And then there will be a list of tests underneath that, that that test that exact capability so that you know it is working properly within your cloud. So after about a year working on this, we fast forward again to the OpenStack Summit in Paris. And the guidelines that the Dev Core Committee has come up with, and they worked very hard on, on, the, on the original set of guidelines, were advisory. That means that they were asking vendors to go out and check the code against their clouds and you know, have comments. You know, how, is the, how, how, how is the guideline working? How is it not working? Uh, the problem was is that if you don't require somebody to do something, they, they don't do it. Right? Businesses have a lot of different interests and product interests. And, and, and so there was, it, it was recognized that, there was, that, we, that we were kind of at a, at a, at a turning point. Like OpenStack was, was you know, it, it had been around for several years and we still didn't have this interoperability standard. And we were running the risk of if we didn't have an interoperability standard, then we might never have one. So not, 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 not too far after the OpenStack Summit in Paris in December of 2014, the OpenStack board approved the first guideline, which set up the original 117 must-pass tests across compute and storage, um, you know, across compute and storage. But there were, you know, with the goal of enforcing this guideline by April of 2015. So, uh, you know, so all new OpenStack powered license agreements starting April 1st would be required to pass the DEF core tests. 
But we had a lot of work to do in between there. The first was we had to define a test procedure, right? How are we actually going to run the tests and collect the tests, right? Vendors needed help on this. Um, the second was we actually had a lot of broken tests, right? As I mentioned before, there were 117 tests, and all of these tests are taken from Tempest, which is the OpenStack, the official OpenStack QA project, right? The decision was is that we would determine the capabilities by what the community thought was important, and what was important was what was being tested. And so we, pull, we, we pulled all of those tests from the non-admin uh, API tests, um, but there were a bunch of things that were broken. You know, things that, 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 that in some ways tests were tuned for dev stack, and when you put them out into the wild in a, in a, in a production deployment, they just didn't work, or there were just some tests that didn't work. Um, but this is, this is an example of, of, one of the, one of the great things about the OpenStack community, right? You know, the board decides on these tests, but then we bring them to the community, and particularly the QA community, and they were absolutely amazing in looking over the set of tests and the problems that we were having, and we all sat down, sat down together in a room in New York during this time, and just worked on fixing as many of the tests as possible. We also had to solicit vendors to participate in the launch. So we had to get vendors on board with this, right? We wanted to, we, we wanted to show that you could take an OpenStack product and you could run the tests and you could go through it. And again, the, 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 and one of the nice things about this, by, by, by engaging the vendors, we were actually able to uncover a lot of problems that we had with the original guideline. Mm -hmm. um, and, and because we know that as a committee, we can't cover all of our bases, we can't know everything, we built in a safety valve into this, where we can allow vendors to come up and flag a test. By flagging a test, you actually remove it from the must-pass pool, right? And, but, but you have to have a reason that you flag a test. Like, the test is testing something that isn't widely available. An example of this is, uh, we flagged one test that tested capabilities that were only in one hypervisor, right? Well, it's not realistic to have an interoperable standard where only one hypervisor can provide the, can, can provide the capability that the test is checking for. Others are just for bugs, right? So if the test has a bug in it, it's not reasonable to expect someone to pass that test. And so they can flag that test with the assumption that at a later guideline, once that bug is fixed, that test is going to be reintroduced. And so six months later, at the OpenStack Summit in Vancouver, we had an amazing response to this program. By then, we had 19 products across 16 companies passing the first standard. And you know, if you think about that, that's, that's, that's incredible. Our original goal was to have maybe four or five companies. Um, but we actually had a standard that was attainable, that tested something concrete, um, and, you know, and, and was successful. You know, and that's not to say that we let everybody in who, who, who tried to pass the test. There were still a number of companies whose products, for some reason or another, you know, weren't able to pass the test. You know, and that's, you know, you know, you know, and that was something that we had to work on for, for them later. But, you know, it was like, but it was a, it was a vindication of, you know, of nearly two years of work on developing an interoperability standard. So 2015 was a big year, right? As I mentioned before, we had these flag tests, 117 tests, and in March, we had flagged nearly 50 of them. That's almost 50% of the tests, which were just invalidated. So it's not surprising that a lot of companies were able to pass these tests. But keep in mind that all of the companies are gonna have to renew these licenses at some point, and so the testing standard is going to get more rigorous as time goes on. We're going to enforce more interoperability as time goes on, and uncover a lot of the problems that we have with the original standard, with the original test suite. And indeed, the numbers bear that out we did a really quick succession of guideline releases. Right? We'd go back to the board and say, we need to fix the guideline this way. We need to fix the guideline this way. We had, a really, we had a really fast cadence for it. And while we were doing that, we were actively fixing the bugs. And we went from 50 tests, almost 50, 47 tests flag, down to about 30, all the way down to seven in the latest guideline, you know, which, is, which, is, which, is, which is pretty incredible. You know, in the meantime, starting with zero companies who were OpenStack powered, according to the DEF Core guidelines, and already we're up to almost 30 companies and products that have passed the guidelines. So it's been, it's been a very successful project, and it's, it's still, you know, in its, in its production, it is, it's, it's very early on. So what are some of the consequences of this? 
right? Well, one of the things that OpenStack has faced is there are a bunch of projects that have updated their APIs and are currently in the middle of transitions. And some of these transitions have, have lasted years. Right, moving from you know, the Keystone V1 API to the V2 API to the V3 API, the Glance V2 API to the V3 API, Cinder from V1 to V2. They're all in varying states of deployment. But one of the things that the Dev Core Committee uncovered was that it's actually important that we push all of these APIs forward and start to standardize on them. So we've seen a number of clients start using the latest version of the APIs. A number of proxies are scheduled to use the latest versions of the APIs. And we've also started looking forward and saying that maybe proxies aren't the way to go. Maybe we should start dropping the proxies and really focusing on the projects themselves and the APIs. And so there's, a lot, there's been a lot of API and client maturation and also a highlighting of the importance of keeping the API stable. So a number of OpenStack projects now, and this was happening before, but is now being largely pushed as the way going forward, are using microversioning so that APIs change slowly and deliberately rather than in giant leaps that take years and have a huge impact on the ecosystem. We have greater vendor participation, right? So the Def Core Committee was pretty small to start off with. There were a few vendors who were involved with it. And now more vendors show up, more vendors are testing, more vendors are giving their feedback. And so we've created this nice feedback mechanism where the developers get to work with the Def Core Committee and help identify what's important. And then the users and the vendors see how that standard is working and they can raise objections to it, they can raise issues with it, they can, they can, they, they can offer suggestions and give really good feedback. Um, and, you know, and I think that the feedback loop that we've seen in the, you know, since, the, since the Vancouver Summit um, you know, has, been, has been really positive and has been really growing. As I mentioned before, test suite improvements. You know, not just in finding bugs and squashing the bugs, but also in usability of the test suite. We're starting to think really hard about you know, you know, Tempest has hundreds of configuration options. You know, writing documentation that says, how do you configure the test suite? What's important? What's the basic way to start? How can you consolidate your configuration resources into one file so that you're not chasing down all of these configuration lines across this enormous file? Um, plugins to allow other projects to plug their projects and their technical testing expertise into the official QA project as a plugin so that we have one integrated testing infrastructure that we can then use to, to, to verify interoperability rather than dozens of testing infrastructures across dozens of projects. And we're looking at growing the program now. Right? I mentioned before that we were largely focused on uh, compute and storage. Now, I mean, uh, 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 yeah, compute and storage. Um, but networking was implicitly required by this. Identity was implicitly required by this. We had all of these images were implicitly required in this. We're moving to add a whole new set of capabilities for storage, network, and identity that's going to expand the scope of the APIs that we're testing and that are being pulled in and, and, and defined as core OpenStack. And this is, this, is, this is coming forward in the next guideline. The next uh, uh, Dev Core guideline is scheduled to be approved in uh, a uh, January 1st, so it's going to be the 2016-01 guideline, and um, um, you know, and all of these capabilities are going to be advisory, so that we have another six months for users and vendors to really go out, run the tests, and identify problems. We're also moving to a more deliberate six-month cadence of guideline updates. And the way that works is that each new cycle kind of starts three months before the next summit. Um, so we start three months before summit with a new guideline where we say that this is going to be the draft status. Two months before the summit, we've identified new capabilities that we would like to include. One month before the summit, we've scored those new capabilities, and we're preparing, um, and, and we're, pre we're preparing an advisory guideline for review by the board. This is including things like what new capabilities are we advising that they add? What capabilities do we advise that we deprecate? Um, and, uh, and we place the guideline into the review status with the approval from the board of directors. Then after the summit, we get to work. One month after it, vendors and communities test the guidelines. They offer their feedback and problematic tests are flagged by the second month. And then by the third month, the guideline is set to the approved status. One of the nice things about this cadence is that by Placing the major points at the mid-cycles, 
right, where we're creating a new set, where we're, where we're creating new guidelines and we're starting new guidelines, it gives us time to, during the development cycle, to roll the new guideline out and then get people to use it so that there's not a mad rush right before the summit of companies trying to send in their test results and, uh, and, 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 get, and get powered licenses for the new products. So how does the Dev Core Committee work? Yeah. Um, or I mean, how do you, how do you uh, test a product for the OpenStack powered license? The first thing you do is you set up your product with the testing requirements. Uh, right now we require an API endpoint with two guest user accounts, no administrator access. Um, you need to set up your cloud with two images, so they need to be independent images that can be booted to verify that you can, you can, you can start your systems up. And you need to have some sort of publicly accessible network. So you need a network that once a machine comes up onto it, you can SSH into that machine. Um, and, Neutron has, and Neutron has a bunch of different networking models to accomplish this with. You download uh, the client tool that we use for interoperability testing called RefStack. It's the RefStack client. Um, and you configure it to run the Tempest test suite using the values that you set there. You then run the tests, and RefStack will automatically upload the results to RefStack. And RefStack will do a lot of the heavy lifting of telling you whether or not you qualify for the guidelines, even taking into account tests that have been flagged. And so this is a recent test result that went up, and it is passing the latest 2015-07 standard. Yes. And you can choose different standards. Um, you can see which tests failed, um, you know, and go back and, you know, if you can, you can get an account on RefStack, you can, uh, you know, the results are anonymous. So I don't know what company sent this to me. Um, but when they, but when they uh, you know, who, who send these results up, but when a company has successful passing test results, they can then send me the RefStack ID and I can verify that they've indeed passed the tests. You know, so this is a way for companies to, to, you know, to, to do a lot of testing and maybe not embarrass themselves um, until they're ready to share their results publicly. Once that happens, they send the results to me and they apply for the OpenStack powered licensing agreement. Um, and then the product appears in the OpenStack marketplace. And so their product is featured with the description of it, um, the guideline that they passed, uh, and the OpenStack powered logo. And these are all available online for you to, to look. So if you're a consumer, if you're an end user looking, trying to decide which OpenStack product you want to use, you can see which guidelines they passed. And you can compare you know, which, which, which interoperability standards they passed. And we've decided to grow the program even more. And so we started with OpenStack Power, with compute, storage, and platform. But there are actually a number of logo programs within the OpenStack Foundation. We also have an OpenStack Compatible program. And the OpenStack Compatible program covers non-OpenStack code, but things that can run on or with OpenStack. And so this is storage drivers, or network drivers, or even applications that run on top of OpenStack. And we're rolling out new testing programs developed with the community where you have to pass continuous integration, continuous integration testing for storage and network drivers. And so these are the tests that are defined by the community to be a proper driver for that project. Starting November 1st, all storage drivers are going to be required to pass continuous integration testing within, as defined by the OpenStack community to qualify for the OpenStack compatible mark. And we're hoping to bring network drivers online by the Austin Summit next year. And then we're also looking on trying to define an app testing framework. And so how, how do you show that, how do you, how do you demonstrate that in a repeatable way that your apps can run on top of OpenStack? And so you know, this is another way that we're trying to strengthen the OpenStack brand um, by requiring interoperability you know, you know, as a means to protect the brand, but also as a means to protect the users and the developers. The users who want to make sure that they have an OpenStack system that is indeed interoperable, and the developers who have put in so much effort to create uh, this, uh, this amazing product. So coming back to the idea of interoperability, OpenStack has mature, stable interfaces that are thoroughly tested, they're understood. They're stable and consistent, right? So, so you know, we're, you know, we're, 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 we're stabilizing on the APIs. The tests don't change radically from, from release to release. And most importantly of all, it's open and free for all. You can go download OpenStack and install it right now, and you can have an interoperable cloud. 
you know, and the goal here is that we want to have an OpenStack powered planet. That, you know, and, and, and we're seeing this, you know, a, a large number of uh, um, retailers are moving to OpenStack. Walmart, for example. Um, you know, they, last year they ran Black Friday on OpenStack. Uh, Comcast and Time Warner Cable are delivering content through OpenStack. We have film studios using OpenStack to, to produce movies. You, you know, it's something that um, it's not, it's, um, you know, OpenStack is gaining traction and OpenStack is, 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 is being used. And this is one of the tools that we help create create a world where this ubiquitous cloud, where we have interoperable ubiquitous cloud platforms. So that's the end of my talk, and thanks everybody for coming, and we hope you have a good time with OpenStack.